Yes, would you ask Ms. Matthews to come back in, please? Thank you. Right, Ms. Matthews. Well, sorry to have kept you waiting, but we're now ready to continue. Yes. Uh, do, you, uh, do you want to pour some water? No, I have some here. You have Thank some. You. Good. Thank you. Yes, when you're ready, then, Mr. Clear. Thanks, sir. <clears throat> uh, Ms. Matthews. Um, before the break, we were looking at a paper that Janice Ray had prepared for a meeting. And if we can go back to that, RBK quadruple zero zero nine eight eight. And if we can look at item two, and if we can look in the first paragraph, four lines down, which starts with the word however. It says, however, in discussions with the LFB following the Adair Tower fire, it has been made clear that they require us to be significantly more proactive about both the retrofitting of self-closing devices to nominally fire-rated flat entrance doors, where these are not currently present, and the regular inspection and maintenance of all self-closing devices to ensure they remain connected and functioning correctly. The LFB have confirmed their view that a self-closing device is a fire safety system as defined by the Regulatory Reform Fire Safety Order, and as such, Article 11 of this legislation places an onus on the responsible person to monitor fire safety systems in place, and Article 17 requires you to maintain fire safety systems. Now, at the time, did you understand the view to be that regular inspection and maintenance was not just good practice, but how the TMO would in fact discharge its obligations under Articles 11 and 17 of the Fire Safety Order? How we would actually do it, or did I understand that we should be doing it? Well, the latter. That we, sh ha that we should be doing it. Yes. I, I understood um, it was very clear from this that we should be doing it. And the note goes on, we have emphasised our concern that even regular inspections and maintenance where access is readily available will not ensure that all devices remain operational as we cannot control residents who either deliberately choose to disconnect, disengage or do not report defects to enable us to instigate any necessary uh, repair. Now, would you agree that the paper does not present a strong or compelling case for having a monitoring system? Um, no, those words don't say that. No. Um, did you make a, a stronger case at the meeting than is set out in this paper uh, for a monitoring programme? I, I don't believe so. No. And why not? Uh, I think because um, I felt that we would find it very difficult to be able to uh, discharge our um, uh, requirement because of things like access and the fact that we could um, actually do that inspection, do the repair or replace, and the very next day the self-closer is damaged and we might have an inspection and they happen to notice or they check that a particular door uh, um, doesn't have a self-closer. Um, and we would have great difficulty in proving uh, that we are continuing to maintain that. Now, the minutes of the meeting can be found at RBK 000 14072. And if we could turn to page two and item five, uh, which, as you can see, is concerned with the installation of self-closing doors and annual inspection. Uh, what it says there is, will be a huge cost if we want to do this. Nobody has an inspection process at present, and it's not a legal requirement to have yearly checks. Could be an option to include in the fire strategy. Need to develop a programme to take to scrutiny. Liability if the doors are broken would be with the TMO. Laura agreed to hold off recommending inspections programme at present. Uh, did you agree with the position set out and as recorded in that minute? That's what was um, agreed, uh, discussed and agreed. Uh, did you agree with it, was my question. Uh, what agree with the outcome? No, with the reasons given and the outcome. Um, I agreed with the reasons given, and and in terms of the outcome, as I said before, we really had to accept what um, the council uh, from Laura was saying to us that they wanted us to hold off doing the inspection program. Did Robert Black agree with the reasons and the decision? Uh, Robert Black was at that meeting, and he heard the same uh, response. So I have to assume, I can't answer for him, but I have to assume he agreed to that. Uh, was there any discussion of the need to comply with the outstanding deficiency notice that had been served in relation to Grenfell Tower? 
uh, what, when we were discussing this specifically, yes. uh, no, we didn't discuss the specific deficiency notice. Now, following that meeting, on the 3rd of March 2017, uh, you emailed Laura Johnson copying in Robert Black to confirm the discussion, and that email can be found at rbk trouble zero four double six zero three. Now, your email is at the uh, bottom of the page, and I invite you to read it, and when you're ready to ask the document manager to take you to page two. Yes. And if I could ask you to go back to page one so you can refresh your memory of Laura Johnson's response, which is at the top of page one. take it therefore that for the reasons you've uh, just outlined indeed previously you agreed with the Lord Johnson's decision to push the program back to f a five-year program I, I didn't agree but I didn't have a lot of choice because they were funding it so you accepted it as a fait accompli at I best. did can we look at minutes of the health and safety committee committee meeting from the 13th of June 2017 which can be found at TMO 1002548 Now, uh, you can take it from me that there is no mention of the deficiency notice in relation to Grenfell Tower. Um, can you help us as to why that deficiency notice wasn't discussed at this health and safety meeting? I can't because it should have been. Uh, was it a thought that crossed your mind at the time that it ought to have been considered? Uh, probably not because there's so many items on the agenda and it just got missed off, but they should always have had a standing agenda item. Are you able to assist the panel as to whether the issues uh, identified in the deficiency notice, the remedial action, had been completed by this stage? I can't remember to confirm that. Are you able to say whether they were completed within the time frame prescribed under the order, under the notice itself, namely the 16th of March 2017, 16th of May 2017? I believe there were still some actions in progress, but I, I can't confirm that. I can't, I can't remember the dates for things, sorry. Thank you. I can now turn on to a separate topic, which is the emergency plan. Now, can we look at the emergency plan uh, that we think was the last um, version before the 14th of June 2017? That can be found at TMO 1001389. And if we turn to page three, uh, we see that uh, this is a revision executed in February 2016 mm. uh, based on an original version first draft in August 2004. Uh, are you able to confirm that this was, in fact, the most up-to-date emergency plan? I believe for, it was, yes. Yes. Now, what steps did you personally take to ensure that the emergency plan was kept up-to-date? Um... I'm not sure that I actually uh, took any particular steps because I um, relied on Janice to um, program in when um, uh, policies and procedures needed updating. Can we look at some minutes from an executive team meeting on the 11th of November 2015, so after the Adair um, Tower fire, at which the emergency plan was discussed? We find those minutes at TMO 00840450. And if we can uh, go on to uh, over the page and it's really the third substantive paragraph which starts with the phrase, the TMO's emergency plan. 
was discussed, and it was agreed that it would be good for ET to have a session with Janice Ray and Hash Shamshun to get a greater understanding of who owns and updates it, and lessons learned from the fire at Adair Tower, Jill to arrange. Now, you were at that meeting. Yes. Uh, can you recall the substance of the discussion? Um, I think what uh, I think what I remember was, as a result of the Adair fire, um, it wasn't clear what TMO's role was in in an emergency, and therefore we needed to have a look at our own emergency plan in line with RBKC's plan to ensure that we were clear on what our role was and, and therefore update our plan accordingly. Did you study the emergency plan to uh, see what further clarity could be provided? I believe I did at the time. Did you study any available guidance uh, to ensure that the contents of the emergency plan uh, reflected best practice? No, I don't think so. Did you ask Janice Ray whether she had done that? I, I don't think I asked her that question, no. Is the bottom line that, in relation to this, you relied upon advice and guidance from Miss Ray? Uh, what, in, in relate... In, in relation to the review of the emergency plan? Yes, the review of the emergency plan was going to be um, with Janice and Hash, as well as ET, because Hash is one of the first responders in our emergency plan. As a member of the executive team, did you make any substantive contribution to the review of the emergency plan? I don't remember. Is that a, another... Uh, I, d I honestly saying, don't no. remember because the, the discussion would have been more collaborative and we would have discussed various items. I, I can't remember. Can we now turn to look at some email correspondence from councillors? And if we go to TMO 1001798, and it's an email, uh, the originating email is one from Councillor Mason to Councillor Marshall on the 8th of January 2016, which can be found at page four. So Quentin there is Quentin Marshall, mm -hmm. Pat is Pat Mason. Under the heading Adair Tower Fire, it says, at the last CCSC meeting, I was asked to request if you could tell us what advice the TMO gives to its tenants in the case of a fire. This question came up because the Borough Fire Commander told the committee, the last time he visited, that although Adair Tower flats were fitted with smoke-proof doors, people opened them during the fire, letting in the smoke, when they may have been safer staying indoors, and then started walking down 30 storeys of smoke-filled stairs. Perhaps it's not possible to stop people leaving a building in panic during a fire. Now, Robert Black is copied in by Councillor Marshall for response, who in due course copies in you and mm. Janice Ray. Mm. Uh, were you copied in for information or to provide a substantive contribution to answer the point? I think it was to um, work with Janice on providing a, um, a substantive response to uh, the councillor. Now, the issue was then raised at a services scrutiny committee on the, 18th, oh, sorry, on the 8th of February 2016, and those minutes for that meeting can be found at RBK 000 58637. If we go to page three, and if we look at the uh, second paragraph, it says this, Councillor Campbell drew attention to the statement on page one that fire safety information is provided to residents on the TMO website. She considered this inadequate as not all residents would have access to the website. Referring to page two, she drew attention to the comment that some dwellings were provided with LFB leaflets and asked which ones were not. The chairman undertook to take this up with the TMO. Now, it would appear from this sequence that RBK, RBKC councillors had concerns about uh, the provision or lack of provision of information to residents. Is that fair? That's what this says, yes. Now, those concerns appear to have been prompted by the experiences at the Adair Tower fire. Does that accord with your memory? Uh, I believe so, yes. Um, whatever the <coughs> position, the information set out in the paragraph I've just quoted uh, suggests that whatever the TMO were doing about providing information, it wasn't working effectively. Is that a fair observation? That's what this shows. Did it accord, though, with your understanding? Of what was actually happening? Yes. Uh, no. You thought more was happening? I, I understood that more was happening, yes. And you understood from Janice Ray, presumably? 
yes, and other people in the organisation um, and from uh, the Health and Safety Committee when we would um, uh, comment on things that needed to be uh, noted in the link. Thank you. Now, could we go to uh, further email correspondence uh, involving councillors? And Councillor Mason sent an email to Mr Black on the 14th of April 2016, which can be found at TMO 00863733. And if we can go to page three within that chain. And we have here the originating email from Councillor Mason. Dear Robert, fire safety information to residents. At the last meeting of the Cabinet Corporate Services Scrutiny Committee, where there was an update on the Adair Tower fire, it was noted that fire safety information is provided to residents on the TMO website. One committee member wondered if this was adequate, given that not all residents would have access to the internet for various reasons. Is this information provided to residents in other ways? Now, Robert Black again copied you and mm. Janice Ray uh, mm. for a response, and Janice Ray's response can be found on the first page of this chain. It's a somewhat lengthy email sent on the 15th of April. Might I invite you to read it to yourself rather than having to listen to me, and then if you could indicate uh, when you need the page turning and when you finish reading it. Yes, yes. thank you. Now, <coughs> yeah. was that a comprehensive explanation of the TMO's uh, arrangements for communicating fire, uh, the detail of the emergency plan to residents as you understood it? The emergency plan or fire safety? Well, emergency plan. The substance of the emergency plan to residents. The, Shall I ask the question again? Yes. Do you accept that this response was a comprehensive explanation of the TMO's communication of the emergency plan to residents, as you understood it? We, we were... I, I'm not sure it's the emergency plan because it's the fire, uh, it's the fire safety um, uh, um, communication. Uh, I, can't, I can't think what the word is. Um, that, that operates for... Uh, all our blocks and advising residents um, about what to do in the event of fire and offering uh, assistance um, in the way of a um, LFB home visit. Uh, so I answer? haven't quite answered your question, is that right? You, I, think, <laughs> I, think we, I think that's probably right. Uh, putting it differently, do you accept that this is a comprehensive summary of the information given to residents explaining what they should do in the event of a fire? Yes. Thank you. Now, we Sorry. looked earlier at the notice of deficiencies issued in relation to Grenfell, issued on the 17th of November 2016. Now, can we look at one of those particular deficiencies? And for that purpose, can we go to TMO 100476262 forward slash 6? And if we look at Article 15.1, it's the last one on that page, and it says, at the time of the audit, your procedures to be followed in the event of serious and imminent danger were inadequate. It was found that fire action notices were not displayed in your common parts. And under the steps considered necessary to remedy the failures column, it says this, adequate procedures for serious and imminent danger and for danger areas should be established and followed. This can be achieved by providing adequate fire action notices within the common parts of the premises. Now, did you investigate what procedures for serious and imminent danger that existed at Grenfell or indeed any other high-rise residential building? Uh, no. Why not? Um, I suppose what I was uh, looking at was that the uh, comment says that this can be achieved by displaying fire action notices in the common part. So I was taking that as a, a recommended action that we needed to take to um, uh, complete that. 
Did you ask the question whether fire action notices were required not only at Grenfell, but in other high-rise residential buildings in the TMO's housing stock? I, I, I didn't actually ask that because um, I was aware that if they weren't in, in Grenfell, it was quite likely that they weren't elsewhere in the stock. Um, and I believe it was at this time we had a, a, a discussion and I agreed with Janice that we should put them in all our blocks. Was that minuted anywhere? Uh, I doubt it because I think it was a discussion we had sitting next to each other in the, in the hub. Now, can we look at an email chain that you were copied into between Robert Black and Councillor Blakeman? Um, started on the 24th of November 2016. The chain can be found at TMO 1001-15249. And Councillor Blakeman's email is at the bottom of the chain. And she comments on the blog uh, run by Mr. Defan. And if we can look at the first email in the chain, which is on the fourth page... There we go. And you see there that the final paragraph of Councillor Blakeman's email is, is in fact a quote from the blog. Could I invite you to read that quote and indicate when you're done? Yes, I read it. Uh, would you accept that it's clear that Mr Defarn was concerned at the lack of information as to what to do in the event of a fire at Grenfell Tower? That's what he's stating there, yes. Uh, would you accept that the blog itself suggests that the communication of fire safety instructions uh, was not wholly effective given Mr Defarn's uh, lack of certainty? Are we just talking about this paragraph because I never read the blog? We're just talking about this yeah. paragraph? Um, yes. Now, Councillor Blakeman um, says, uh, in relation to this, and it's at the top of the email, just at the top of the page we're looking at, conveniently, she said this, while Mr Defarn engages in hyperbole in his Grenfell Action Group blog, it is read by most residents of the Tower, and the most recent article causes me concern. Mr Defarn discussed the fire safety issue with me at a recent meeting, and I did point out that the instructions of the event of a fire had been included in one of the refurbishment newsletters. However, I do take his point that instructions are not permanently available on notice boards, nor in a discreet letter to all residents and in appropriate languages where required, and I am asking whether this can be rectified. Now, according to Councillor Blakeman, the instructions in the event of a fire appear to be limited to uh, a refurbishment newsletter. Uh, is that a fair reading, at least of her email? Correct. Did the absence of permanent fire instructions on notice boards, was that an issue that, about which you were aware, first of all? Um, I wasn't aware of that, no. Was it a matter that uh, Mr Black had raised with you, either before or after this cor his correspondence with Councillor Blake? Not, no, not before. Um, not before, no. Now, um, Mr Black asked Janice Ray to respond, and we can, if we go to the bottom of page two, uh, we see Janice Ray's substantive response, which starts with the words, with regard to... Mm -hmm. And she says there, with regard to fire procedures in Grenfell Tower, I can confirm that these were included in newsletters to the block, and they're also documented on our website. Further, we do publish regular fire safety articles in The Link magazine to all residents. We write to all new tenants to outline the fire strategy for their block, the procedure to follow in the event of a fire in their flat, and also a fire elsewhere in their block, and advise them of the London Fire Brigade's free home fire safety visit and how to access this. Additionally, I can advise that we are currently considering a programme of installation of fire action notices. Now, did you think that these arrangements were sufficient? Um, yes. And the basis of that was presumably assurance from Janice Ray that nothing more needs to be done save in relation to fire action notices. Uh, I mean, I think there's, there's always more you can do and you can keep posting um, information through residents' doors and I understood our fire risk assessor did some of, some of that as well. Um, you can always do more, um, but... I'm not sure how how much more you can do and be sure that the residents have read it and understood it. Now, um, if we can just 
stay on this page, but scroll up and see um, Councillor Blakeman's response. She says this, many thanks for this. I think the TMO often puts too much faith in the link and generic newsletters. Even when read, they are then discarded. So residents do not have a permanent record of information unless they have the nature of an archivist. This is why personalised letters are sometimes of more value. However, I think in this instance that fire action notices on each floor will meet the problem. Didn't Councillor Blakeman hit the nail on the head? Residents required a permanent record of information as to what to do in the event of a fire. Um, I agree. And... Did you see fire action notices as being that permanent record? I, I think fire action notices would help, but I would say that fire action notices get torn down as well um, because we had to put up fire action notices, and I can't remember where, and I know that they had um, been removed. So I, I, I agree. Fire action notices is part. Uh, I think uh, providing people, even with personalised letters, they'll still discard those. And if we can um, just continue up this chain for Mr Black's response, it, you may find an echo um, of the views you've just expressed in Mr. Mr Black's email at the top of this page. And he says in the second paragraph this, on the other subject, mm -hmm. our experience and others is individual letters are not effective either as they are not opened or read or filed. This is an area where the company has to do certain things to protect itself, and it starts with all new tenants and then reminding tenants on a regular basis. We also do fire checks, and our fire consultants will speak to people when he's doing his checks. I agree the fire notices on each floor will address the problem as well. Now, does that statement represent your understanding of how the emergency plan, i.e. what to do in the event of a fire, was communicated to residents? Yes. So letters to new tenants reminding or regular reminders to residents as to what to do. Yes. Presumably advice given by Carl Stokes as and when. Yes. And finally, fire action notices, which at this point had not been put in place. Yes. And I, I would add that um, if an event like another fire in another borough or a, a particular fire where we needed to advise residents, for instance, of um, things like... Um, uh, electrical equipment, having things checked, like tumble dryers, there was an issue over that. We would put that into the link um, to advise residents. Uh, thank you. Now, um, we touched on earlier on Janice Ray's capacity, not her competence, but her capacity to fulfil mm. her functions, um, essentially as the competent person under the order. In evidence, and I'm thinking particularly of day 140, pages 48 through to 49, she essentially said that she spread herself very thinly. Now, first of all, were you aware that she spread herself thinly? I, I, I probably was aware that she was trying to do too much. And did you ever say to her or give her advice uh, as to how she should um, do what she could uh, the only thing that we discussed on this is whether um, there was any more uh, that Adrian could take over on her behalf um, uh, and uh, whether, in fact, there were any sort of lower level things, perhaps that Cyril, who was responsible for the office facility side, maybe he could help r rather than perhaps what I should have do done is said, actually, we need an extra resource. And what was, first of all, what was Miss Ray's response to those suggestions regarding um, maybe delegating work down to others in the team? Um, I, think, I think we did look and she was willing to um, see if there were any things that she, more things she could give Adrian to do. And how successful was that initiative? Uh, we did have a slight problem that Adrian went off sick um, and therefore we had to delay um, moving some of the actions to him. Uh, did the thought, did it cross your mind as to whether um, an additional person was required in order to help Janice Ray or to sit with her or to support her, discharge her health and safety role? Uh, I'm afraid it didn't. I wish it had, but I'm afraid it didn't at that time. And I don't know why. It just didn't. It just, I knew she had a lot to do. I don't know why I didn't think we ought to go to the council and ask for more money for this. I... Maybe I felt that it, 
I, I might not be able to put a strong enough case to the council for it. I, do, I don't know, but um, I didn't, I'm afraid. Now, in that regard, can we go to TMO 00866269, uh, which is the Performance and Development Review appraisal for Janice Ray? And we can see on page one, top in the middle, it seems to be dated May 20, well, it is dated May 2015. Could we go to page five, though? And we see year-end performance review, April 2016. Do you see that? Yes. The top left? So, sorry, to, oh, April 16. Now, if we can go to okay. page 19... We see the line manager summary. Now, would you have completed ah, yes. that? Yes, yes, it should be signed as well. But yes, because it. If we turn oh. over the page, oh. no signature. Oh, there should be one somewhere with the signature. Well, that's what I was going to ask. <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah. Is this, that this is definitely my. You wrote that. Yes, because it talks about following the fire to dare. And so it's likely, therefore, that. The date we see on page five, i.e. April 2016, is the accurate date for yes. the performance review. Yes. Now, we're on page 20. And can we look at the penultimate paragraph, which starts with Janice exhibits very good TMO behaviours and has built good relationships with other teams, managers and individuals internally as well as externally, particularly with the LFB. She has a strong desire to get things done and completed correctly, but struggles with time management and tends to take on too much herself, sometimes not identifying when she really can't achieve the outcome she would like uh, when she has promised indicated. For example, rather than trying to produce all the health and safety committee papers herself, she should get others on the committee or within the company to produce and present the papers. Uh, this would very much help her to get the papers completed and out earlier. Delegating and time management are two behavioural activities for next year. Now, you noted that Janice Ray was struggling with time management and taking on too much herself. Mm. Uh, did you observe that she did not have capacity to carry out all her tasks? That's what that's identifying there. That, that, that there were some things that she didn't actually complete um, as she had promised. You've suggested she asked others uh, on the Health and Safety mm. Committee for assistance. Mm. If that assistance had pr been provided, was it your assessment that she could have performed all her functions effectively with that support? I think that was just one area. I think there were probably other areas that um, uh, she and I could have looked at as to whether she should be doing that activity or whether it actually should sit somewhere else in the organisation, which is where I started when I came in and, and looked at her role. There were obviously things she was doing that others should do. And I think maybe at this time there were still things she was doing that maybe should sit somewhere else. Now, having had the benefit of going through evidence um, over uh, mm -hmm. today and yesterday, do you think the limited number of people in the health and safety department had an adverse impact on the TMO's ability to discharge fully and effectively its fire safety duties. And, and as you just said, having been able to look at everything and taking a, a view from hindsight, yes, I think <clears throat> that's probably the case. Uh, do you think there were any indicators at the time that there were insufficient number of people in the health and safety department fully and effectively to discharge the TMO's fire safety duties? Um, possibly, because I think you can see from this I'm still assessing that position, um, or certainly in 2016. Maybe by 2017 I should have actually identified that perhaps we needed additional resource uh, as you say, to um, discharge our duty. I can't say whether I thought that at the time. I know at this point I was still reviewing it. Ms Matthews, thank you. Um, sir, I've reached the end of questions for the moment. Yes. I'd be grateful um, for uh, 15 minutes to review my own uh, papers to see whether I've covered off everything and see whether there are any other y yes, questions from others. Right. 
Uh, well, Ms. Matthews, when Council says he's reached the end of his mm. questions, we always have a break to give him a chance to check that he's not left anything out and also to allow other people who aren't physically present to suggest questions that perhaps ought to be put to you. So we'll have a break now. We'll come back at five past three, please. Okay. And then we'll see if there are any more questions for you at that point. Thank you. All right? Thank you. Thank you. Would you like to go to the usher, please? Thank you. All right, five past three then. Thanks, sir.
All right, would you ask Miss Matthews to come back in, please? Right, Miss Matthews, sorry we kept you a bit longer than I indicated, but we're ready to go on now. We'll see if there are any more questions for you. Yes, Mr. Kinnear. Uh, just a few. Thank you, sir. Um, in your statement, you explained that you were approached about applying for the role of Director of Financial Services and ICT at the TMO in 2015. First of all, who approached you with a view... Um, it was uh, an agency, a recruitment agency. And uh, did that? Per did you know anyone at the TMO, or did anyone you know at the TMO have any involvement in your interviewing or the recruitment decision itself? Um, in the uh, interviewing process, um, I was uh, I had um, more than one interview, but Robert Black was in one interview. And one, one of the interviews involved uh, Sasha Jevons and um, Yvonne Birch and also two of the resident board members. Uh, did you know any of those individuals before you made the no. application? Now, when you were interviewed for the job, uh, did any, any member of the panel ask you about your previous experience of health and safety generally? I don't think so. Fire safety? I don't think so. Was it raised with you at the time, or was it clear to you that health and safety would be part of your portfolio? It was clear because I was sent um, a, a job description or a job outline um, from the recruitment agency, so health and safety was identified there. Uh, given uh, your candid evidence yesterday about uh, uh, that you had no previous uh, responsibility experience or training regarding mm. health and safety and fire safety, uh, did you yourself have any hesitation in applying for a job that uh, consisted to a significant extent of health and safety responsibilities? Um, no, because I understood it to be um, a strategic and um, managerial role rather than being the technical um, expert. Uh, did you volunteer that you had uh, limited health and safety and fire safety experience at interview? Um, well, they had a copy of my um, CV, which identified um, the uh, roles I'd taken before, um, uh, and I can't remember being specifically asked or, or raising it. Now, can we turn to a completely different topic, and that's gaining access to flats. Now, if gaining access was a difficulty for the door closer programme, did you consider approaching all tenants and explaining the problem to ensure that they understood the importance of the door closer programme and the need for them to give access? That would have been part of the communication uh, uh, as part of the programme that we would have done for all residents block by block as, as the programme commenced. Uh, did you discuss with Theresa Brown, Laura Johnson or indeed anyone else uh, or seek legal advice on the prospects of amending the tenancy agreements or the leases uh, to allow RBKC or TMO the right to carry out uh, repair works to individual flats? Um, the issue in relation to le uh, tenancies, um, I, I didn't discuss that with uh, anybody um, as far as I remember, but the issue about leases, um, I was aware from part of the original 2011 uh, door replacement programme uh, that there were a number of um, outstanding leaseholder doors. And um, as I was uh, responsible for managing the home ownership team um, that um, basically uh, dealt with all the uh, leaseholder issues, I was aware of the um, legal discussions that were going on in relation to um, access to, to leaseholder doors and that future leases would have the wording changed to demise the front door, flat front door, to the council and not to the leaseholder Thank to you. enable that work to occur. Thank you. Now, my final question is this, with the benefit of having gone through the evidence over the past two days, is there anything which you would have done differently? Well, I think um, from a number of things that have come up, I probably would have done a number of things differently. Um, we were talking earlier on about resources for health and safety. Um, that certainly became clear after the fire when we did bring in additional resources 
and um, that uh, considerably helped some of the workload that was um, that was then on us. Um, probably one of the things I should have done was made sure I myself had proper training to be able to do that role. Um, uh, I think there were probably several other things that I might have done differently, um, maybe looked at the, the more at the reporting that we were doing for health and safety. But I think I would state that, that health and safety was really important, and I was absolutely certain that was a really clear responsibility. But I also had responsibilities for fin finance and uh, ICT and the home ownership team. And there, were, uh, there was a major ICT um, uh, programme uh, implementation going on for which I was sponsoring. Um, there were various things on from the leaseholder point of view um, where I needed to manage and be involved in um, uh, concerns from residents, leaseholder residents. So there, there was quite a lot of responsibilities. And I think also... Um, it would be important, I think, for the inquiry to understand I'd only been there two years. A lot of the things that were uh, not working well or were in place or not fully in place um, occurred through the work that my predecessor had or hadn't done and some of the activities of people in the organisation prior to me joining. Ms Matthews, thank you. Um, thank you for attending these past two days to give evidence. Thank you. And I'd like to thank you as well, uh, Ms Matthews, on behalf of all of us on the panel for coming here to give us your evidence. It's um, always very helpful to hear from the people who have been directly involved. Uh, and, of course, you're one of those important people. So we are very grateful to you for coming along to, to uh, tell us what you know. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And you're now free to go, of course. Thank right. you. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Kinnear. So that concludes the evidence for today. Right. Um, tomorrow, and indeed for the rest of the week, uh, you'll be hearing evidence from Mr. Black, the former CEO of the TMO. Right. Well, we'll that means we will stop at that point today, and we'll resume at 10 o'clock tomorrow. Thanks, sir. Good. 10 o'clock tomorrow, then, please.